it can get. So hello everyone. And this is welcome. recorded by the way, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> hello everyone and welcome to Time Before Grimsby, New Perspectives on Indigenous Heritage and Culture of the Grimsby Region, a presentation by Cindy Lee Ecker Flagg. I'm Rona Wenger, Director and Curator of the Grimsby Public Art Gallery. With me tonight through the magic of technology are Janet Oakes, the Manager and Curator of the Grimsby Museum, and of course our presenter, Cindy Lee Ecker Flagg. We are pleased and honored that you have chosen to spend your Thursday evening with us. I will start this evening by taking a moment to reflect on the importance of the land on which we gather, our provider and sustainer, and on the history of this land. The Grimsby Public Art Gallery and the Grimsby Museum and the town of Grimsby are situated on treaty land. These lands are steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Hattawan-Mandarang, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Intended to guide the relationship between the First Nations and Europeans, the two-row wampum is an important symbol of everlasting equality, peace, and friendship. It remains the foundation upon which Canada was built, and we recognize that this mutually respectful relationship between nations is essential for reconciliation today. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island who live and work in Niagara today. As part of the regional municipality of Niagara, Grimsby stands with all Indigenous peoples, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. We recognize that we must do more to learn about the history and current situation of Indigenous people. This will help us better understand our roles and take responsibility to towards reconciliation as treaty people, residents, and caretakers. The project you will hear about tonight, Time Before Grimsby, was developed to improve our current understanding of this wealth of human experience. Researcher Cindy Lee Ecker Flagg, who is herself a spiritual leader and traditional knowledge keeper, brought together fragmentary historic records and traditional knowledge and practice to show us a more complete understanding of this heritage. In this presentation, she will discuss the goals and accomplishments of the project and present ideas to help the community continue to learn and move forward. We would also like to thank the region of Niagara's Niagara Investment and Culture Program for providing the grant that made this project possible. We also thank the Niagara Region Native Center, whose expertise, advice, and support at the start of the project was sincerely appreciated, and who also secured additional funding for the researcher position, significantly extending the scope of our work. So thank you so much. And I will now turn the presentation over to Cindy Lee. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, we did a sound check earlier, but I just wanna, you know, make sure we're experiencing really high winds out here. And I'm not sure if any I wanna make sure that we can uh, hear everything. So I'm just waiting for the share screen. Okay, can you see that okay, Rona? Yes, okay, thank you. I always like to double check. Can you see the teacher in me? <laughs> the teacher in me is always like wanting to, to double check things and make sure it's okay. So I wanted to make it larger for you, but for some reason, it's not wanting to go and I'm scared to make it go. Please go, <laughs> please work. <clears throat> no, I don't have to, okay. Is that good now? You can see that fine? Okay, awesome, thank you. Okay, let me just want this, okay. No, resume slideshow. I'm sorry, it's giving me a bit of grief here. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm really thankful to be able to share um, and, and delve into some of the history. I'm not a historian by any means. I'm not um, an ar archaeologist. I'm certainly not an anthropologist. I do like history, um, but I, um, I am a um, one that works in a very spiritual way and my connection to the land and the history and I, I feel that this this project will also be able to as you will see will have sharings across many different avenues and that that's what we were hoping for as we move forward and and I look at that okay all right 
So we're going to look at a little bit of the goals that were created um, and accomplished. And there's been there's ones that are in still in progress and there's ones that are yeah, up, up and coming. So the original goals and accomplished of the work was to build public awareness, cultural, specific knowledge and perspective. So I myself, to give you a bit of history, I've lived in the Niagara region for 55 years of my life, which will be in March of this year coming. My whole life, I was born in Haldeman. I've lived in Wayne Fleet. I've lived in that whole Niagara region. I've, I've invested in various aspects of, of living here with my family growing up, as well as growing up as a child and my, and my children that are full grown adults and my grandchildren now. And so I'm, I'm really um, have seen a lot of changes and a lot of different things unfold in my lifetime um, here in the Niagara region. So we want to look at engaging community to initiate learning through presenting special events. So part of it, we will talk about some of the special events that we've had and some ones that are up and coming that will engage community in some of the awareness, as well as starting those dialogues and really building relationships around the history um, to, of Grinsby prior, prior to um, Grinsby settlement. Okay, so we're looking at that uh, 1600 to 1700. More complex process in developing policies or like policies and strategies. Um, I'm really big on policies and strategies, and I've worked in a lot of areas of creation, governance, policies, and strategies over my time serving in community. And it's an important piece to also look at that and um, to, to see um, if there's things that need to be put in place and, and to review those of, you know, to ensure that they're um, they're inclusive, um, their terminology is correct. And as you go through the documents, as I've gone through the documents, there's a lot of differences from the terminology and the language to what we have language today. So again, really requires one to really understand the terminology and the wording at that time and to where it is today. Also to understand and develop a document, a research of indigenous roots in the local area. And this um, was found through and is continuing as, as Rona had mentioned, still more work to do in looking at not just the books, newspapers, but also um, vetting or speaking to some of the indigenous communities, which I've done and still have a few more on my list to be able to, to, to speak with. And just to build that knowledge as well, that, ver that um, verbal, that narrative knowledge, that, um, that, that knowledge that's not written down necessarily. Building Niagara's cultural sector, I mean, you know, I, I love the work that's happened. I've actually been able to spend some time with, um, um, and you'll see in my in my references with Michelle Lees and, and stuff that Tim is doing. And it just, it's just wonderful to be to be able to connect in those in that in those ways and just to see the beautiful work that's happening in the education knowledge from um, the Niagara Parks through to the Niagara Conservation and just really engaging Indigenous voice and, and knowledge into understanding um, the history, her story, his story, the story of um, pre pre uh, loyalist pre settler. So um, and the importance of, of that and, and how that how that is spoken about today and how it's still very live, very live today. Also increasing access to information and events, you know, um, events, uh, building those, those relationships to, to see, you know, what types of events and also getting people more in, involved in creating even more opportunity for learning and education. All right, so let me take a little drink here. Promoting cultural partnerships public, private, and municipal. And some of that's happened already. Um, I got a, supposed to have a gap, I put gap. Sorry, that's a spelling error, my mistake. <laughs> um, I didn't get this to run in time for her to tweak it. So the gap, it should say, information on pre-settlement history, her story, history, discussion and understanding, as I mentioned about indigenous population, to celebrate the history, her story about what's happening and before Grinsby to increase the understanding of the residents of Grinsby, but not also the residents of Grinsby, but also the Niagara community, but also the indigenous community too. You know, um, there's many things that in my journey that I've continued to learn and, and um, one of them is the language and one of them is the culture and one of them, you know, there's a number of things that, um, that I've taken up in, in that learning that didn't come in as, as part of my upbringing. Um, so to increase the her uh, heritage, improve social connectedness, builds upon reconciliation, and also respecting culture, languages of indigenous people. And we'll talk a little bit about that. 
what we're doing there. A creating community awareness, education, understanding, positive, and which is constructive to prehistory. So a little bit about some of the events we've done. We've done some already. And so on September 30th, um, there was um, there was a ribbon uh, decommission, which happened at the Art Crinsby Art Gallery. So prior to that, um, there was a, a lot of um, discussion and awareness um, around the um, Orange Shirt Day, but then what became the National Truth and Reconciliation Day and discussion about you know the um, the ribbons and and what will happen with the ribbons and, and doing that in in a in a in an appropriate way in a, in a in a respectful way right and how how to decommission that during that time we had senior um, leadership there from Grinsby which was wonderful and um, as well as we had staffing pertaining to the project of the, from the museum and the art gallery we also had some visits from some of the schools that came and the students came in and were able to be part of that and also placed their ribbons um, in um, tied in in recognition of um, their events that have happened with residential school and, and the intergenerational trauma impacts that still are unfolding today and the education around the how to move forward and, and how do we not let that happen again, but what, what could each one of us can do as our part, not just Indigenous, but also our non-Indigenous um, neighbors as Canadians living in the country. So a PowerPoint was created and, and I created a video that also educated um, as a professional staff, just to be able to learn more about the history and how that it's not just about that one day and, and it's become much more and that each day how are we moving through our um and how can we you know look at that reconciliation and what is it that we're that we're picking up in those 94 calls of action as not just an organization or agency but also that of an individual right in our own walks so we had October 21st, we had grandmother Renee Thomas Hale. She did an online presentation as well. And her talk was about the first teachers, our mother, the earth and our helpers, lessons that come from oral tradition, storytelling and how creation prepares for our lives journey. We had a fairly good turnout for that as well. And again, just engaging that traditional indigenous knowledge. And in the form of we did it online because of, of the practice of COVID and, and, and how we've not been able to gather, but it was, it, it was just sitting in that circle and sitting in that one mind and in communion as we are right now and, and hearing at those teachings and understanding the relationships and how we are all part of that. And so we had um, Grandmother Renee um, come in and, and speak about, about that. We also had an event on the 13th on Saturday and that was with an Indigenous artist um, from Six Nations. She actually um, has family there. She lives outside of the reserve, but she's an emerging artist. And so she's a young artist and we have a number of emerging, emerging artists. And this gave an opportunity for her not to just have a presentation and have people visit and watch her work and explore that which she's creating and that which she is creating at the time of her presentation, but for her also, she had said like through her, in the survey that I, I uh, did a survey after she really did enjoy to be able to share that culture and to, to share the the work that she's doing and ex, you know how her beadwork and her painting is reflective of um you know who she is as a, as as an indigenous woman and her family and where she comes from from her nation so um again that she's um she's from you know she's locally within the area so she's from this territory originally and still is here today. We have had some discussion on land acknowledgement and just what what does that mean? You know, what what does land acknowledgement mean? And really started looking at different land acknowledgements and actually was able to sit in a talk from Wilfred Laurier a few weeks back and one of the profs was specifically talking about land acknowledgement and you know that it is about you know, not just doing that line, but what it, what are we doing when we speak about that? And how are we engaging in 
um, that reconciliation, but also it's not just um, acknowledging, but what are we doing? Is it, you know, and I had an opportunity to look through a number of cities and towns as well as provincial parks um, within Southern Ontario and Ontario to observe and to look at their land acknowledgements and also delve a little deeper into the work that they're specifically doing um, in preservation or stewardship of the land, um, acknowledging history, um, presenting education, um, you know, do we have Indigenous um, representation in various committees and or boards or, you know, within um, levels of, of leadership and within within the, the capacity of, of the different ones that I, I looked at. And um, so we, we've talked a little bit about that and, and, and some of the stuff is still further in discussion. We've also talked a bit about the sensory garden. Um, there's a wonderful sensory garden that is um, just outside the um, art gallery in Grinsby. And it's really for the preschoolers, but you know, what, what place to start with, with our generation that's our young generation, those are yet to come the faces unseen, right? as well as all our generations. So the sensory garden is, is a great opportunity for the um, young ones to be able to experience the indigenous plants. So we have, we're, we've had some discussion around the types of plants that we would, we would um, be best suited or, or would, involve, would involve and initiate conversation um, in the sensory gardens and even looking at having them in the languages and, and what languages you know that we could um, that we could play. So I had been had some contact and working with Polytechnic on on the cultural center with some discussions around language and and just being able to learn about those plants that are truly um, aren't always the real flowery, pretty ones that you see in a garden, but are the ones that are in our grass you know, our dandelions that many think that are a nuisance or our stinging nettles that people don't like that are really important plants, really valuable medicine plants. And both those plants I use every day in my life, a stinging tea, nettle tea, as well as dandelion root is one of the teas that I have. We have plant and, you know, it's, it grows in our, in our grasses. There's so many sumac, the sumac um, berry and, and what that provides and, and how to prepare these plants. So, you know, just really getting some discussion around the importance of that knowledge and, um, and the importance of, of living in um, harmony with that too, right? So um, we, we've got a little bit of that sort of started as well. Developing um, evaluations and surveys in a, in a way that's um, because the surveys in, are not just for participants like yourself, but also like for the for the presenters. That's um, you know a, a comfortable survey that really does um, ask the the questions you know that you 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 want to be inclusive and and feel that you're really getting the the information and not just um, kind of like checking the box, right? So looking at how to create those and being um, encompassing and what is the terminology and, and how how do we approach the questions and what does a question maybe mean differently to somebody else and, and how do we look at that from a, a cultural lens you know with our indigenous people so looking at you know some of those evaluations and marketing of course on social media which has always always been re reviewed and looked at as well so this is a really wonderful map. I actually um, had a really wonderful conversation with um, a fellow that's a historian um, in the Niagara region, and he's a wealth of information. I know he's done a lot of work um, in a lot of different um, communities and organizations for history, and um, he, he sent this map to me, and after I do the PowerPoint, I might try to pull the, the big picture up so you can see it. Um, I just don't want to do that now because I'm scared it might, it might, I might lose that, okay? And this is, I tried to find um, the error of this map and I might need to email him and ask him because it did go on to Brock University. And this is where this came from, was from Brock University maps. And you can actually go on there and find many maps, but a lot of the maps are like, you know, 1700 and up, they're not dated back. This particular map is really wonderful because it does show a lot around the battles, places of water mills, um, as well as footpaths, houses, and native villages. Are, and they use native quite a bit in a lot of the terminology with indigenous villages in the area. 
And um, because I was really asking about footpaths, I was really looking at, you know, maybe part of the project is looking at identifying certain aspects of roads by letting people know that, you know, Highway 8 is now called Highway 8, but before that it was, there was another name and, and it was a footpath and, and, you know, who traversed on that, right? Um, it's important. And that's another way to recognize the pre, um, pre like the history before settlement, right? That what you're walking on is, is um, you know, was, was a path that was walked on by many Indigenous people prior to, um, you know, European settlement and European traveling through the land, right? And so when we hear a lot about those, the roads that we call them today, but we don't necessarily always maybe realize that they're very significant. So a little bit of the project I was, was to work a little bit on the past and I'm still working with Polytechnic on looking at, they're going through some of their maps they have to see if there's anything that they can find that will also identify some of the, the original footpaths in the area. I think it's important when, you know, a lot of, when I look through a lot of the research information, there's a lot of question, I'm gonna put it out there right now around dates and, and times of things. Um, some of them are out by two or three years. And it really indicates as I was delving through very little information about um, the, um, the, the indigenous of the area, which we'll get into that. And so, you know, I wanted to put that first and foremost, um, you know, and what I've, I kind of gather through different documents, but also it's a point of, of some discussion as well here when we're going through this. But, you know, um, when we look at, and I tried my very best to also um, take out the word neutral and put in um, Akawan Eke. And I'm not sure if I'm saying that, and I ask for forgiveness of the ancestors because I'm actually um, sitting on the land here that's not in Grinsby, but um, is a land that was also inhabited by the nation, right? So, and I have a few beautiful things that um, I have found in my, in my life that definitely relate back to um, equipment and things that people would have used. So um, I'm just asking for forgiveness on, on the this, this saying of, of the word, um, but I feel like um, I'd rather try to, to place that there than use the word neutral because again, when we talk about identifications of people and nations, you know, there's lots of um, words that um, are easier to say or would have been said differently by one that would have been recognized. And then the word neutral came from the fact that as you'll learn, and if you don't already know, is the, ne the neutral um, way about how the people were. And so it was a natural way to place that, but they actually did have um, their own language. And so it gets important when we, as we learn about indigenous people and, and our histories that we, or her story, and you see, I keep saying history and her story because there's many story, the narrative that's there that we then start to move towards to the, um, the, the language that truly speaks to um, the nation, right? And what that's about. So, you know, when we look at the cultural way of life, there's a lot of similarities here um, to um, um, the Haudenosaunee, the Uwehoi people. And, you know, and when we look at the food sources and we look at, you know, if, you know, that when I look through, I, I, and I've written some things says it was in the document because I, it was a point of discussion, but we hear that, um, you know, the housing was very much long house. They also had the style of lacrosse. Um, and a tattooing trade and service. The tattooing is something that's really starting to, to come forward in a lot of our nations now in the original tattooing and how it was done and why it was done and the different symbols that, um, that um, met things, right? And so it's very old practice and has been around a very long time. And of course it wasn't, uh, it was used, um, the elders tell me it's used charcoal poke and charcoal, but, uh, but there is significance to those symbols. 
um, the trade that happened, you know, um, when you think about the people living in the area, we're in between two lakes. I mean, it's it's Lake Erie, Lake Ontario. We've got Grand River. We've got Niagara River. We've got the Forty Creek. We've got Big Forks. We got a number of the Beaver. We got a lot of like the Welland River, which is now was once called the Chippewa River. I remember when it was called the Chippewa River, and it got changed to the Wallow River. And you know, these are all waterways, and they're all pathways. And again, living where I live, I'm I'm very aware of some of the um, oral um, histories that have come through my husband's family of many um, pathways along the creek that I'm not too far from that actually um, were traveled from the, the people, um, the Indigenous people here and took up um, um, rest in my husband's family's farm. And so they've always spoke about that and had great, very good relationships with the people. But again, there was a, a lot of um, movement along these um, waterways. And, you know, one, because um, when you have waterways, you have a source of, of everything that's there. Um, also two um, pathways are, are formed by, you know, animals are formed by then people, and then eventually we turn them into maybe walks and roads and things like that. But, you know, people would have traveled easily along these, but knowing that's where they're, they're going and also knowing that there's all these wonderful things that could be there in, in travel. Um, so people would have, indigenous people, they set up like, so then we look at the villages and where they're set up on that other map, you'll see that they're all located around water. And of course we wanna be located around water. I would too, all of us do. So that's pretty, pretty consistent and it would make sense anyways. Um, but also the soil, the richness, we know how rich this um, particular area of, of the Niagara region is. I mean, um, it's under the um, the One Bowl, um, uh, One Spoon Treaty, um, and understanding that we only take what we need, um, we leave for others, and we want to maintain um, things in a very good stewardship balanced way. Um, and then, you know, if we go back one more, we could talk, you know, about the, the two war wampum belt, which is, you know, was between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch, but but that, that um, belt with the one bowl, one spoon really does talk about how to look after and how to live, right? And so again, you know, when we look at the history and we look at the area of, of, of a flint, you know, so there's a lot of discussion around that importance of the flint. And, and you see that, you know, as you're walking in the fields, you see that in the escarpment, you see that in the smaller escarpments. And we have the Niagara escarpment, and the Onondaga escarpment. We have like, you know, I'm living kind of on an escarpment where I am. Um, I'm on the Niagara escarpment, but I'm also living on another escarpment that actually transverses its way all the way from the other side of Port Coburn and Fort Erie and all the way through and up through Haldeman. But a lot of it's been removed because of farming and, and, and taking out that, that soil. So there was a lot of um, ways and a lot of the documents talk about that ways of being and knowing and doing. And again, it's about observation, right? It's about living in and understanding the environment and what's around us. Um, we know that it was centered around the Niagara Scarf. And again, I talked a little bit about, you know, it, it, the richness, the, 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 um, the richness of animals, the richness of vegetation, plants, um, wood, um, cover, shelter, water, uh, fresh water, springs. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, and, and today we see that in the farming that happens, right? Um, so, Again, you know, I found that, you know, 20 miles east of Hamilton um, is a lot of documents talked about. And there was a number of um, settlements of the um, Atawaknak and or the neutral. And so the this particular settlement was very large, um, whereas a lot of the other settlements when detected, and I'll get to that in a minute, um, as we get to that slide, was also didn't unfortunately lend a lot of history or history or story narrative because of looting and because of destruction, right? Um, so there was a lot more understanding, but we'll talk about that when we get to that slide. So again, um, there was a lot of the villages were located anywhere from Milton, Brantford, St. Catherine, St. Davis, and some along Grand River to South to Lake Erie. Right, all of this area here. An estimating of 40 villages, populations from 12,000 to 30,000, again, depending on 
when you're looking at that number, you know, you're looking at that number roughly before settlement, before check, um, not chicken box, but smallpox, before all kinds of famine or, or even hard winters, right? Where people wouldn't have um, been able, you know, the weather and, and just the wintering itself may and not been very supportive. Um, and then of course, then the um, interaction of settler to the indigenous populations and and then we start with our warring and and, and we get in you know that happens later but so th those numbers are kind of really broad when you think about it but there's a lot of factors and variables in that and some of that is that it's just not recorded the um the the recordings didn't happen into the jesuit priests were um, coming in and that wasn't until like 16 16 in the late mid 1600s and then moving forward from that the governments, um, they um, they did, you know, there was a governance of cheese, there's a governance of elections. Um, there was also importance about how they also, you know, govern things and how they, they had a consensus, right? Very similar to um, the Confederacy and, 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 and here, they did talk about the, they had their own Confederacy as well. Now, there is some discussion about this, um, some connection with the Seneca Nation and, and um, some warring that dissipated the numbers of the neutral, but there's also other indications that um, there's also other nations that also, um, also were part of that as well. So again, you know, 1580 is where I was noticing that when we start, when I was looking through the burial site um, document book by Kenyon, I think it's Kenyon, you know, you're in there, you've got copper, you've got shells, you've got actually artifacts, I want to say like items, I don't want to say artifacts, because to me, they're still living, items that are not from here. So there's trade happening, trade possibly with, um, might've been directly European trade or could have been indigenous trade, indigenous trade, right? Might not necessarily been that that copper pot came directly from the European copper pot. It might have come through several different nations that traded something. Whereas this, whereas the neutral would have traded tobacco, they would have traded flint, they would have traded, um, you know, various types of furs that were relative to this area. So that there was a lot of trade happening, and that's very evident in in the um, site. You know, when they looked deeper into that, and again. Looking at the 40 villages, they talk about it being in hamlets and again, um, communally living together in those hamlets, right? Um, where you have several long houses, the palace sites, but also like different families and different responsibilities and roles of leadership within that. And again, where I see here is that, you know, the one daughter, one we call the Huron, it was interesting because they said that a lot of the documents indicate there was a similar language, but it also falls on the Iroquois languages. And so there was some languages that were similar. So it was when I read this, it was like the Wendell would um, say that they spoke with slightly different language and they would, um, the Wendell would see um, um, the neutral as uh, meaning strangers because they spoke differently. But then also the, um, the, um, the neutrals also see the Wendell as speaking a slightly different language, right? So there's been some speculation that maybe they were connected at one time, but again, I couldn't really find anything specifically on that. And if that was the case, it might have been, I think it would have been so far along that we wouldn't have not known that unless it had been documented in maybe some, you know, items that we don't have in, in books and we don't have in museums. Um, because some of the things that we have in our nations aren't in those places, right? And uh, maybe it's, it's held in that knowledge. So many different languages. I, I try my very best here to include the languages, um, the, the names um, of, the, of the nations rather than just saying the Cayuga and the Oneida. Like I, like I think it's important that we, we see the name and we, um, and I know I can't speak, speak the name, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna attempt that, but I, I really wanna respect that because there is something to be said in that language and what it means. It has more meaning um, as well as when, you know, I think it, um, even for Anishinaabe, what that means to someone saying that I'm from a Ojibwe nation, right? So um, it, it's, it, the, there's, the language has um, a story, it has, it talk, talks about what, what the person or the people or the nation is, is about or, so that's important to have that. 
Um, we had a, in 1600, 1641, they had Joseph de la Roche and, you know, he, he was actually um, asked to come in and um, move into speaking um, and teaching community um, Christianity. It didn't go very well for the, um, the Awakani nation. Um, the Wendelt were a little bit more, um, were took brought took that up a little bit more of the of the Christianity, um, and what ended up happening was that there was one art piece I read was interesting that you know makes me wonder that you know they weren't fond of wanting to learn it. It's pretty clear um, they were more comfortable in, in their in their teachings and what they were speaking and what they understood of their ways of being and knowing and doing, and that. But the Wendell also put out that this particular um, fellow um, that was teaching the language and he was a priest was kind of not to be trusted. And so that created a little bit of not sureness within the um, aqua And they said, like, that's it. I'm kind of done, <laughs> you know, with the neutral, they're kind of, I'm done. I want to do this. Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, it, it, it could have been a strategic. It might not have been strategic. Um, but again, um, I thought that was an interesting piece. But you know, at the same time, you know, if, if some people aren't always wanting to, to shift and change into something that in which they're not, they don't know of, they're not familiar with, right? I'm just gonna move this here, okay. Alrighty, so 1638, 1640, we know there's Europeans. We also know there's a lot, a lot of epidemics of, of diseases and smallpox. Um, we also know there was a lot of warring with the beaver wars that was happening at that time. And again, the neutrals were not really wanting to do any of this. They, they weren't really wanting uh, to be part of, again, hence their neutral position. Um, but like any, any place where there's warring, it, it gets kind of challenging and sometimes you end up falling into taking sides or being part or being in the middle of, of and so they, they do talk about their, their last stand being at Burlington Heights, which is now called Dundurn Park. And, um, and then eventually the lands, um, the Mississaugas, you know, came and take up some residence in the lands. You know, I looked and found some more information pertaining around 1615 with um, Mr. Barul and also him being asked by Mr. Champlain to really, you know, talk about the um, bringing the Christianity, faith and religion. And again, as I mentioned, they weren't really quite um, keen on that. Um, there was a lot of different attacks and wars that really, um, took the like lowered the numbers of the people and again this also um happened also with a lot of other you know diseases that came into place that not just fathom like like not being like food and not being able to buy but you have to also think about like when when you're not exposed to certain types of viruses and bacteria, then you don't have that immunity. There's no need for the immunity. So, so you know, we know that very well with the smallpox and how that moved through not just this nation, but many nations that, you know, that was a, an immunity that the people didn't have. There was other types of diseases and lots of other types of transmittable diseases that also created a lot of um, um, reduction of numbers of indigenous people. So um, I wanted to put that in there because it, it, I didn't see that noted, but it, I mean, it's something that wasn't really thought about back then um, that that might be a cause, but you know, as we delve deeper into looking at, you know, yeah, it is, right, it is. So um, I wanted to put that in for some discussion there. And again, I found again, a documents just really indicating that they weren't really um, wishing to war, they didn't want to pick sides. They didn't want to to get caught up in that. So um, the area, you know, for a period of time, really became like after the neutrals um, were either assimilated and some were assimilated. And again, it's really difficult to find information on that because as we look at different um, nations, well, you can see that you know, the, there's some that are. Um, have passed and, and, and have had the death and then some have, you know, been assimilated into another nation and then that that happens. And we see that in, like I say, law nations within Canada, it's really hard to know how many and what nation, you know, and this would be assumptions to that the nations in the area would have possibly um, brought in 
possibly some of the warriors or brought in some of the men or some of the women, right? Maybe not, maybe not, maybe they didn't want to do that. You know, so there's always that discussion about that there could have been, but again, you know, in some of the, the work history that I've learned about my own nation and things is that, you know, it is not everybody would have been assimilated. It, it would have been very good reason that you would, you would um, have those, um, I guess now we call them prisoners of war, right? Um, but they actually become, um, if they're not prisoner of war, where you're not actually, you're utilizing their, their skill set, you know, back, then they would have utilized their skill set, you know, um, that would have been the reason, um, unless it was to be a prisoner eventually, you know, to, to remove, to remove life from them at some point. Um, but there would have also been the reason to, you know, take up possibly the option that, this may be um or individuals that could be part of our nation that will benefit we will benefit you know us which would then been under a straight watch and things over time right um and also too we talk a little bit about dispersing and 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 again like there's a lot of fragmented history and um that's what i found with um my research and a lot of the information that I've pulled out of, or I've looked at documents I've pulled out, it's coming from the um, Champlain Society of the Jesuit Relations documents. And knowing that the Jesuit priests were not in the area, you know, until later, a lot of that history isn't there. And what is there is, is, is understanding that through um, a burial or from, um, you know, just that narrative from somebody here, knowing that that was written down. So it's been a little bit of a, a struggle to um, really um, find concrete, some concrete evidence. Some of it is very evidence and it's very concrete, um, but there's some other speculation around things. Um, you know, um, in one document I had read, you know, about the matriarchal society and in the document, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, that I've really needed to, uh, one needs to really be mindful about how they're reading the documents that the terminology and wording isn't, isn't always appropriate. Like we wouldn't use those words today. And there's also a lot of you know, as we with, you know, we can only um, even in science today, you know, there's will we feel that this probably speculates it can be this, but we don't know for sure. Um, so I seen some of that as well. And just having a real um, eye for as you're reading, reading through and really asking, okay, you know, in a in and one document piece I seen was a major linical society, which would make sense um, as a, a, my understanding is that we were all a bit major linical at one time and some society uh, nations are still major linear and some are patron linear. But with that, there was some discussion around, you know, taking the prisoners and, and taking um, some of those as being women and that some of the women, you know, were, um, you know, murdered or, or or their lives were ended as well. And so there was a question about, you know, what would that, but again, you know, it's it's like, we, we do we really know, right? And, you know, it isn't that, you know, that, ha that hasn't happened because it has happened. So again, um, there would might be good reason why, you know, that certain lives were spared and certain lives were were taken in, in the way of, um, land and, and looking at protection of land and you know it's really about the resources it's really about the stewardship of the land it's about what it provides right and um before pre-settlement you know i've always understood that you know there would have been discrepancies and there would have been you know imbalances and discussions that needed to happen between nations but they would have then if it would have happened and they might have had different types of outcomes depending on what it is but it does really come down to, um, you know, ensuring that your community or your nation is is taken and looked after, right? And the land is part of that, or we don't exist. So, you know, it, it kind of leads into understanding that, you know, could there be or may have been, you know, ways of, of thinking or doing things that might have shifted for the need of that, which we see that today, 
you know, we see that today um, as well. So, um, you know, there's some, again, without knowing and living in that era, it's, it's can be sort of speculation in some ways. So as we move through, again, as I said, most of the notes were taken from there. I did pull a little bit from the Grinzy Historical Society here and, um, and just to sort of kind of, and, and that's not really, this presentation is really not about, about the historical, and uh, because we're looking at 1600, 1700, but um, if you're interested in more of that, you can look there. But I did look a little bit at the loyalists as well. I did get into a little bit of um, looking at some of the families, and there's like a lot of main families, but one of the ones I sort of followed a little bit on was the Nels family, and, and you know, a little bit of looking um, that, seeing that that they, you know, a French family with Denels, and then eventually um, due to religious prosecution, which is because they, you know, weren't really in line with or maybe choosing to follow the specific religion that where they, they were from, um, kind of shifted the name a bit to Nels, and then they immigrated to um, America through Germany, which happened a lot. I mean, my own family did that, <laughs> my own dad's family did that. They immigrated through from England through to Germany and then into Gore Bay, you know, so there was a quite a bit happening through certain countries to get to North America and a lot of changes in names as well. Some completely changing their name to be completely different and or changing around letters in the name or taking endings off. And again, that happened in my own father's family and it was a little bit difficult to find some of the ancestral uh, tracing on my father's side for that very reason. Um, but again, there's, you know, it's just um, for here, they're taught or I learned the prosecution of not falling a specific and back, you know, religions were very specific and very strong in 16, 1700s and 1800s and you know as we're getting more into the 19s and the 2000s or 20th century now it's you still see you see a big diverse there's quite a diversity around face and and uh, belief systems and religions so you know i followed a little bit about the three brothers moving to new york and 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 living in the mohawk valley and really connecting again there is some discussion there on the bigger document about their relationships with the indigenous people in the mohawk valley and also um, some of the work that they did in, in the military, the father um, work, you know, working in, and just being connected to, and in the document, they say, you know, they don't use the word indigenous. I'm using that in this presentation, but the word is used in, in the document as such. And then they talk more about them um, moving um, into the Grinsby area and eventually moving up into um, having some land that um, was leased. And I want to talk a little bit about lease um, from Joseph Brand and from the Six Nations. So, you know, and so in that there's some kind of like, there is some discussion in, in a few of the documents about some questioning on land um, that was granted or received and the quantities of land that was received and how it was received. There was some discussion about um, the brother and him not having the same, possibly not having the same, um, well, respectfulness of, of, of uh, land and, and communities and, and nations. And so there was a little bit of, of discussion about that. But when we look at leased land, um, and I put, it, it did say leased, and it's important because, you know, um, if you have an opportunity to do uh, work and look at the Haldeman track, the original Haldeman track, uh, because this was, would have fallen in that, um, this piece here that we're talking about the farm, um, the Haldeman track was huge. Like what it is today is, is, it's very not the way it was. And a lot of that land, um, there's lots of reasons why that land has shifted. But in some of those situations, I can't speak to all of them and I don't, I, I won't because that's not part of my position. And it really, it needs to come from the nation. And, and I'm aware of some of it because of being indigenous and, and working community and, and, and they are family, right? Um, my husband's from Tadenega, they are family. Um, but also it's, it's more appropriate to come from one that can, really speak to the you know the land and and how that shifted from the very large Holloman track to where it is today and uh so 
in that there's a there's discussion around leasing and, and leasing is really just about leasing it's not about selling land it's not about ownership it's about if you lease an apartment you you're in an agreement you you pay an amount or you look after the land and keep it well um and then when your lease is up then it comes back to the people like it was never yours to begin with right so you know there was a number of a, a number of leased land that really was and maybe there, there might have been some financial exchange like i said i can't really speak to that but I, I i know that when i sat with different teachers over the years you know we think about land we we some of the people that came over were wanting to farm you know they came from farming families some of them they weren't all military connected they wanted to farm they wanted to be part of the land they wanted to look after the land and and really um you know, take care of it, right? And live off of it in a good way and provide for their families, their wellness. So, you know, for for an Indigenous, that would, you know, that would be what we want to do too, right? So some of those arrangements were, you know, leased in the way of knowing that that would be happening. But over time that shifted and those conversations kind of like dissipated and dissolved and, and things then came up and then you'll you know, can learn more history about the different land claims that you've heard of in the area outside of Hamilton and around Six Nations. So, and what that's about, right? And even up by, um, you know, the biggest one being Oka crisis. So, and that piece there, but you can look at that and understand then you know how this went from leasing to you know ownership right and and why that is so again you know there was the connection and he was quite involved he was quite involved and um you know in grinsby there is a, there is a home that you can visit there is um his home there and really i wanted to put in this because in order because he went his family went through so ups and downs as a lot of families i suppose do but he rebuilt his his family and his lifestyles from the support and friendship of the indigenous people in the areas at the time right i mean i i can't imagine you know him coming um when he reached the mohawk valley when they traveled from uh, new york into niagara they talk about them being next to like you know not alive they were like starving they were cold like they traveled you know that's a long ways to travel you know not by car or plane now but you know and so they they weren't well and so there was a lot of need to to get them better and then again you know um obtaining the land and so it it really there's a real need of gratitude there on on that too and and so they do make a statement in this particular document that you know he 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 fared well because of the um the relationships with the indigenous people in the area you know he fared well with you know the leasing of land and um you know the discussions with joseph brett like you know um and he continued to to do work in the area as well so this is just a little bit of recap about the first resonance specifically i just want to still delve into that a little bit um you know when the grinsby site was made aware and, and I and, and part of the project that's come up as well is that my visit to the Grimsey site and having some more discussion around and and we're and I'm actually in uh, in the process of connecting um, with um, well I have already connected with the chief um, uh, chief um, Mark Hill, yeah and um, I'm just waiting on a call back but just start having that discussion on you know looking at because there's a need of of renew or, or repair and also looking at just some other questions that kind of came up on having more presentation and, and a commemorative kind of space um again you know representing not just but again we have to look back when the plaque when this happened in the 1970s you know things were not they are today and um so you know now we're in this place of being able to say okay you know how can we have this to be more of a um, contemplatory and thinking and respectfulness and acknowledging and it to be um, in equitable and it to be not just a sign, right? So these are discussions that sort of come from this project a little bit. And um, I, I went to the site and I was able to um, 
to see that and 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 be able to start that that connection there. Um, going through the um, going through the information um, from Kenyon, there's lots of information pertaining to, you know, um, a lot of the things that were um, brought forward in the study. But also at the same time, um, as we look at that study on the Grinsby site as well, there was a lot of discussion about how things were done again and um, and the disturbance of a burial site. Um, and making sure and ensuring things should be done in an appropriate way and including the nations that are either involved directly with the with that particular nation and or our cousins family stewardships are connected right and so um there is agreement um with the town of grinsby and six nations council so um the confederacy so it's important that um that these relationships are, are in place and and again you know, back in the 70s, and that wasn't quite the first thing one would think of, right, um, at that time. And I'm just that, that's a little bit about what I was speaking about. And one of the things that they, the, you know, when I looked down, I just picked up some things about what I thought was interesting was, you know, um, a lot of the different items that are identified, it indicates a very, um, as we know, uh, people that have a governance that have um, healers that have leaders that have roles and responsibilities and I think that we have to you know for one that may not know that our, our nations ha have that and so the the people um, the neutrals had these things in place they had um, you know ceremonies and times of years they do ceremonies and it's 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 identified in in you know some of the things that they observed and also the trading, you know, the trade items. So you know very, that the European trade items were there so that you know that there's been trade that may not necessarily happen in that area, but it could have happened somewhere else because we were trade over a large area. And if we're looking at footpaths and we're looking at traveling along waterways, we could travel, do a lot of traveling and, and we did and we, we kind of still do, but we do in a car now. It's a little different, but we do do trade, right? And, you know, when I look at some of the things like the glass beads and things, we know very well, these, these are not of North America. Like we know that they're not from here. Um, the cow shell, there was necklaces that were made of copper piping, copper beads, and shells that are not from here. What we just say, Nishami, the, the mega shell. So it's, it's, it's a different type of shell. And I, and I, so again, these um, were in certain of the sites that indicated significance in the way of involvement or roles in community right so you can start to see like a, a definitely the culture that's there but at the same time we um you know um being mindful of how we how we would go about that and so i mentioned earlier the union of indians came in and they talked they, they were you know really needed to ha have some um connection into what was going on and and again this policy and these procedures uh, how we do things would be different now, right? It's very different now because we would, you know, as as I as I um, think about the um, the plaque, you know, my right away I, I'm needing to have the connections with um, a couple of different elders at Six Nations. They didn't give me the other connections to be able to say, okay, this is where the conversations need to happen, and these conversations need to happen with these individuals and about that and that sort of is not my role in that co deeper conversation but just to put that in place before we look at anything else right so um and that this particular site really implemented a lot of policies around how to go about you know um when you have findings like this right like what are the like who is involved is there ceremony um do we bring you know what we bring in the nations in that is connected um and and you know they really form some laws as well about going about this and this particular site being as large as it was didn't have very it had very little if any but i would say very little um like we'll say looting because a lot of other sites it was you know it's a lot of that and not just for the neutral nation but so again this this really brought forward those conversations and put in place the appropriate way of doing things and and who needs to be part of that 
before we actually even start into something, right? Is there ceremony? Is there is there is there prayers? You know, and again, this is a place of rest, right? It's a place of of rest, a place of you know sacredness, right? So, um, so it's it's interesting to read a little bit, and you can see the history in there. And um, the developer, you know, um, and then just a little bit of history about how it started, you know, that this fellow, he, 1976, he, because it was a development of homes and this how it all happened. And you got the, the burial and, you know, where the uh, Florence Martin then contacted the ROM and um, then some of the things were on, on, you know, stayed in Guernsey for a while and then they moved eventually into the ROM. But also the, eventually that led to a very larger discussion on the the re internment of the of um of the people and different various things right which is is sacred and is uh, brought that involvement of community and um and that's something that um needed to happen and that's all part of that not knowing and that's okay you know that's 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 important that 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 is a, there is a rest now and it's done in, the, in that way with those ceremonies that need to be there. So again, as I mentioned, those Reculent Juicerat priest writings are really where a lot of the information comes from. Um, I did have an opportunity to, um, I've worked with um, a few different elders on the reserve and a lot of them have um, been able to kind of lead me um, to to different areas. Um, as I said, I've worked with Polytechnic Community um, Cultural Center, as well as a few other um, uh, individuals that have histories, right? And again, they're just kind of delving into some of their material, but again, it's really, you know, one of the things is, is that the, the Jesuits in any nation, anywhere wrote a lot. They wrote a lot of stuff, like they wrote a lot. If you've ever had an opportunity to read their journals or a portion of their journals, it's quite interesting. They wrote about a lot of things. They wrote about the weather. They wrote about the trees. They wrote about, you know, what direction you were going and how you were getting there and who was with you and and the talks and the food and like they write very much detail. But at the same time, they translate also what they feel that is or they through their own like understanding right their own like like knowledge so again this is where you can delve into seeing that maybe that wording isn't quite the way we would we would say that you know um but that would have been the dialect or the best way they could have explained it i guess um because it would have been unknown to them somewhat right they weren't coming from that the nation of the people Alrighty, so this is just some of the uh, references I've been working with, um, the Jesuit Relations Ally documents, um, the Huron Relations um, went through some of those documents, um, the ambiguous conquest of the Haudenosaunee warfare as well, and again, you look at the, the dates, I'm having to stick in lots of information, 1700, lots of information, 1800, but not a lot, 1600. Um, Hamilton, A People's History by Bill Freeman, um, the Islands of 40 by Janet Powell, Once Upon a Little Town, Grinsby, and at Bromley. Also, the Indigenous Knowledge Center at Polytechnic, Nations, um, Kinnikinniko, and, um, um, and the Land of, um, sorry, Landscape of Nations, as well as Indigenous community members, is where I've um, been able to delve into some of the information. So I'm just going to unshare here because that is the end of this. I don't want to see if I can pull up that map. Get out of there. How many wish me luck on that? Here it is. We did it earlier, but I want to make sure. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this is the map um, that I had earlier, and hopefully we can see that. As if you see that, Rona, okay? Yes, you could just thank, thank you. Okay. So you can see this is a really interesting map, and I'm just going to like enlarge it. I'm going to move it around. I'm going to move it around here. And so when we see like these little circles here, like this, where it says um, Mud Creek, and then you see a little um, a little circle. It looks like a sun. Um, these are mills. These are water grist mills. 
And you can see there's a number of them, right? And when you see um, the little, um, the dots, these are like communities. These would be settler communities. Um, and you'll notice, um, again, here, you can see this is kind of the escarpment, right? And you can see, you know, here we are in um, Grinsby, you can see the little, the settlers at the very beginning. Again, I, I do need to ask this fellow because I couldn't find the age of this map and I'm really curious of when it is. This is really good. Um, and then you also see as we get into, I'm gonna move it up here towards Keister. Now we're getting into the Delaware village. We're getting up to Seneca. You'll see the village. And again, look at this is your Grand River, I believe, is it? Yep. Yep. Coming through is the water, coming through. I'm just going to take that down just a little bit here. You can see, you know, again, um, we've got the dock stator in through here. And you can see the villages that are here. But again, again, along the waterway. And then quite a ways before. Now here, here's a path right here. So this, this isn't, they have it, and this is an Indian path. Okay. And this path transfers all the way from, and my hair, I'm going to take it down more because I, Let's see, district, Let's see, London, 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 here. So this is saying Sovereign, Burford, so if you know where Burford is, all along here, all along, all the way down. And then you can see where it comes into Caster. And it moves here through there. Now, what I'm interested in finding out as we see the pass along here is what are these highways now? And that's what I'm kind of like working at. I, I really am interested to, to see if this is the, you know, um, and this obvious right here is above the escarpment. So this could be the concession, depending if it's in like Hamilton area, right? But you can see it comes, comes along to 40 Creek there we have a down along here in davis big creek this is your escarpment here so that's above the escarpment we can also see that it looks to me as if there is some other footpaths here which are underneath the escarpment and then maybe that's the highway eight today and i did find something in one of my reads about i did find an article um and i didn't put it in this presentation but it's in the other work that i'm putting together about Highway 8 and, and the different highways that were original footpaths. So I wanted to share this a little bit more. And if we go into the ledger, which is way over here. So Tenet and a nest field drawn partially from survey from documents obtained from the Q uh, McGean, McGean department, but it doesn't have the year, I'm not seeing it. And you can see where we have the battles. I'll find one of those, the water, the houses, the villages of the indigenous peoples, fortified places. So that's places of like, this is good land, like fortified, like um, it's good land, we're set up, um, it's, 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 it's well. And then we have the logging, the buy, and the main roads. So I'm just gonna go and find battles here well this goes right over to Thorod and Pelham down into here okay Fort George So we've got some battle here, Cook's Mills, right? And then we've got some battle here on the, on the US side. We've got Fort George here. Follow that along, we can see the battles here, fortified place there as well, like really a lot of stuff going on there. Let's see, we can get into, let's keep going to Lake Erie, Chippewa Creek. 
for Erie. So they kill. So yeah, and again, the battle. So really, really great document. And I said, I, I just couldn't find the year on. I went in to look for it. I couldn't find the year on it. So I'm going to speak to the fellow to see if he knows where he pulled that out of because it didn't when I looked at it, I couldn't find where it was and I really would like to know um, unless I go into seeing the fellow that did it and when he you know when he would have been in that position to do this map so that might give me an idea too right so I believe that's pretty much my presentation to, um, for you and um, I'm just looking to say uh, I want to say thank you to everybody that's um, in here. I see we've got um, nine attendees. So thank you so very much for that time. And I'm going to open up some question and answer, and hopefully I can do that. Or if you have any comments, or turn it over to, to uh, Rona. So thank you so much. I'm still, it still has some work still to do on the on the project. As I, I've got some other areas I, I've come across that um, I happen to come across a document with um, a marriage with one of, connected to Brule and the neutrals. So I, and, and I wanna look a little bit more into some specifics around that because that also talks about relationship building. And it also talks about, you know, on a, curious on, you know, what, what the relationship building was. Because we also know that, um, you know, there was in our nations where we would build relationships with, um, are the European um, settlers and, and to one um, as is just getting to to support each other's allies. There's lots of reasons why. And we know when we think about the, um, I mean, the largest um, um, historical and information that you can look to is the, the, um, the the Métis nation and 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 the and the history and and how um, the nation of, and the Métis and their language and their culture and, and 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 how that all came to be and the relationships that were formed and and for various reasons you know um, there as well so we do know that um, we did have those marriages and we do still today have them um, maybe for different reasons um, maybe for some of the same but uh, so I wanted to look in a couple more documents so. So I'm going to leave. That's my presentation. I hope that you found it interesting and I'm open for questions and answered the best I can. It's now 822 and I haven't lost any power. And I just want to hope that I don't. <laughs> and so I'm thankful for that. <laughs> if there are any questions, there is a Q&A box at the bottom. You can welcome to type your questions in there. I'm just burning a little bit of sage here. I'm so glad that we didn't lose anybody either. I see we had one person step out, but that might have been because they couldn't stay the whole time. But with the winds we've been having, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty hectic. So hopefully, hopefully we keep everybody. So I'm just looking down the list here of people, giving thanks to Adrian and Bobby and Brenda and Jen. Karen, Margaret, Robin, TK, Travis, nice to see you, Travis, um, and everybody else <laughs> here. So thank you for spending our, our time together and being part of the, the discussion. So I actually know two of the names on there, <laughs> which is wonderful. So yeah. And if I don't haven't met you, I, I certainly will in time, I guess. So yeah. We hope to keep you around for a long time, Cindy Lee. Well, there's some really good work that's happening in the Niagara. I know that um, I know Travis is involved in some of that. It's just an amazing, like the work that's happening with the, the speaker series that happened and unfolded. And, and I was really looking, I was really looking forward to part of this presentation. I had a, a ticket to go on the Living Museum Tour. And that was um, a presentation, uh, like that was a tour that was put out by um, Landscape and Nations and with um, I can't say it, Ken and the Kicks. And I was so thrilled to be able to participate um, and listen and learn because the, the, the journey that they were gonna be taking. And then given the experience that we're having with our COVID, we weren't able to do that, but I was told that in the spring that's gonna happen. So I'm really looking forward to being able to go on that tour and just 
you know, just learn more and just be able to just engage in that history because it's an indigenous tour, but it's a, it's a living museum. So it's kind of really getting moving and, and being in different locations. And I, and I know that there would have been some, some good knowledge that it is going to be, you know, shared and, and learned. So I look forward to that in the springtime. So I see a question there. I'm just going to go and take a look. So the question that? is, do you know of any information on the possible Indigenous trail tree along Highway 8 or how that could be identified? Haven't, you know, that's, um, okay. Okay, go ahead. Oh, oh, go ahead, Janet. You might know, you says Janet would like to answer the question. Oh, no, that's for you. Oh, sorry. sorry. I just hit a <laughs> button. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Jen, um, I haven't found anything about that, but maybe um, I know Highway 8 is one of the trails of foot pass. Um, I have it on my other computer, but um, that is identified. And um, one of the things we talked about, and it may not be part of this project, but maybe it starts a discussion around identifying, you know, having even like a marker that it identifies. Uh, you know, specific areas along a road or a trail that 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 you're journeying on that this is what's here and this is what was here before this paved road, right? Um, I'm don't I'll be honest, I'm not too sure about the indigenous trail tree. Is that uh, um, I'm thinking I know that in I can I know in my area there's trees that are marked by certain ways that they were bent and maybe this is what you're speaking about maybe not to identify how you move through those trails which direction and there's a number of them that um, you know over time in the areas where i am here have um disappeared just because mm -hmm. of age and that but i do know that that was also a very <laughs> way of marking and then that might be what you're you're talking about mm -hmm. But I can certainly, that gives me, I write that down as something we can look deeper into that. Okay, I hopefully she could hear me respond to that rather than typing that, so. Okay, Jennifer. Uh, she said exactly, and yes, it is right at the 40 mile creek. Okay, yes. So, so that again, so just to, I want to, and maybe, and this is another thing, when we, like, when I think about the trees in our area, those are, and this tree in particular too, are trees that are, are specifically were created and just um, been and moved and designed for these purposes. So again, it, we, it, it definitely is something that maybe we want, you know, we want to ensure that one, it's recognized appropriately. And that, again, sometimes when we bring attention we want to make sure that we don't get attention in that people want a piece of the tree right i know this sounds but i've been to england nine or uh, four times and had the opportunity to spend a lot of time and a lot of like really old sites there and it's you know a stone hedge you used to about to walk up to it and touch it you can't get anywhere near it because people want to take a piece of stone hedge they want a piece of uh, chitinitsu. You know, you can't even walk up that anymore. So, again, it would it would be a little bit more discussion, um, probably with our indigenous communities as well about is it something that and and how would if we wanted to, if that was something we wanted to look at, how would we present that so that it would also be preserved but also done in a good way but also protected too, right? So thank you for, for that. And that's, I've made, no, I made note of that in my mind, but I'm gonna put it down on my paper here to have a conversation around that with a few elders, um, local elders on that. Thank you for that. And we also have two comments. Travis says, not a question, just a comment. Excellent job, Cindy Lee, and great engagement, Grimsby Museum. Thank you, Travis, it's really nice of you. And Robin says, thank you so much for all this info on who lived in the Grimsby area centuries ago. Much appreciated Cindy Lee and the art gallery staff. So thank you very oh, much awesome. for that as well, Robin. Oh, thank you, Robin and Jen. And thank you, Travis. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, the work that's happening is so important. And, and part of this project as well as bringing the awareness and education to this area. Um, I, I find that some of it has sort of stopped and you could probably understand it's kind of stopped a certain area so it's just really engaging not only the community that's 
been here and living like we'll say the long, long-term residents, but also engaging like and understanding those that are coming into the area, right? And so, you know, where I live, it's pretty much maintained the same demographic <laughs> in the way of population wise. However, um, there's a lot of, um, you know, need for education around, you know, even um, the, the, um, the history of our, of our community and right into the history of, of the flag that's in for my community that I live in and why it, there's certain symbols and people represented on the flag, you know, and, and, and people don't know what that is. So thank you so much. I, I really do respect um, your, um, your comment and your work that you're doing and, and, and hopefully we can bring more, certainly I feel we'll bring more awareness um, to the richness and the, the wealth of, of um, our indigenous nations um, here in the in the whole Niagara region, and which including Grimsby and Beansville all the way up through there too as well. So thank you for that. It's making notes here about the tree. And again, that 40 mile, right? Uh, that's right on one of the pathways, right? As we've seen from that map. So I'm just gonna, and you know, where I will share um, how I know a bit about that, those trees is because as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, my husband's family um, had various lands that they had, well, they're kind of like a family's been here a very long time and had various pathways through their, their land um, because of the waterways that run through the area. And within those land that they farmed had one of these trees. And he remembers seeing it as a child. And, um, you know, it was, it was pretty, pretty special, but it was also a marker for the people to, to know, you know, which, which way to go and, and how to get to where they were going to go. Right. So that's how I know a little bit about it. Um, I never got to see it, of course, in my lifetime, um, but he did, which was pretty special. So do we have any other questions? We just got the three. Some. So I don't think there are any more. If there are, speak now. Well, again, no. thank you so much for everybody that came in and let's and spent your Thursday night with us. And and we will we'll be doing more work and and more likely we'll be able to bring, I mean, Rona or Jenna can speak to that, but we've talked a little bit about some additional presentation. And also there's some. There's some work in, in the way in the new year of 2022 that um, is, is going to be, um, you know, presenting not particularly with this project, but also with other projects and other um, aspects to, to bring that education and really get that dialogue happening, not only in the, in the public within the community, but also, you know, within the school and so people can understand, you know, and that's how we, and that's really about those, those relationships and how we support our, you know, those calls to action, you know, that um, all of us can do and they're very easy to do. It's just, we just doing that, right. And learning. So, yeah, I won't, I don't want to speak to it because it's not for me to speak to, but there is things coming. So, mm -hmm. So um, on behalf of Rona and myself, well, I'd like to thank everyone for being here and particularly Cindy Lee for all your hard work and insights on uh, the history that uh, has been lost in this area and hopefully it is now found and will continue to grow. Um, we look forward to continuing all this work together. Um, <clears throat> just on another note, if you have any questions or comments after the presentation is over, please feel free to email either the Grimsby Museum or the Grimsby Public Art Gallery and we will do our best to answer them quickly. We'll get those questions to Cindy Lee. Um, and please keep an eye on all our social medias and our websites. Uh, Rhoda and I will both be posting um, for more events and ways to get involved. So uh, like, like Cindy Lee says, there are some events coming up next year. Um, so if you can just keep an eye on all our websites and then we can uh, hopefully get everybody out. Hopefully we can get all together in person to uh, have those events and to enjoy the rich heritage that there is in this area. So thank you so much again, everybody for coming. And I hope you guys have a wonderful night and try not to get blown away because it is very blustery here. It just, where I before, live now, so. just before everybody goes, um, if you want to stop recording, I do want to close. Um, and just want everybody to think that we weren't doing that because that's really important. So.